Hey, welcome back to Living Christian. My name is Jason Brita, and you read the thumbnail correctly that I am not a Calvinist. I wholeheartedly embraced everything within Calvinism, within Doctrines of Grace for the past 10 plus years of my life, up to about the last year and a half, where I went on a really deep dive study on the topic of the Reformed view of salvation, which is typically referred to as Calvinism. This is not going to be necessarily my story per se of like, in and out of Calvinism. It's more so going to be what I've learned from the experience of going to the scriptures and going into church history. Let's dive right into the content. If you are new here, I want to let you know, I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel. We typically focus on one of two things. One, either being biblical counseling. I'm an ACBC certified biblical counselor. Or the other thing that we focus on is just hermeneutics and Bible theology, uh, biblical doctrine. And the emphasis is really just to encourage people to be good Bereans. Um, if you like either of those things, I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel. All right. So before we dive in, I want to just share something that I think is just important because obviously this is not a very big YouTube channel at this point in time. I think many of the people that um, are subscribed are people that know me and people that know me from the church that I left because it was a non-denominational church, but it was a church that did hold to the doctrines of grace, Calvinism, Tulip, reform theology in that sense. I just want to really just say something uh, in particular to you all that do watch this is that I know we haven't had, I've not had a chance to talk to every single person since we've left. So this is really my message to you is just to let you know that I love you guys with all my heart. And that I, this is, this is, this was really hard for me to do this because I left a, a whole host of people that I so greatly desired having continual regular fellowship with and loved serving this body of believers. And so know that this is not any attack personally on any one of you. This is more so sharing from my heart what I see now uh, from this journey I've been on for the purpose of just diving into God's word to learn his word most effectively. And so I've got the, so this whole thing is just sharing my opinion. And what I want to emphasize is that I am not here to be the Holy Spirit for you or anyone that watches this video. This is strictly my journey into going into the scriptures and seeing if the doctrines of grace lines up with what I see consistent in the Bible. And, and my journey ended with it has not. And it continues to, to prove that as I continue to dive in. I've not stopped. I've continued to go into the scriptures <laughs> for the sake of just doing this. I, I could not resist coming up with five different points for this video. We're only going to deal with one of these sections at a time. Today's video is only going to be focusing on point number one, which is total inability, predestination and election and seeing that through the Augustinian lens. That in and of itself, I mean, I could take each of those individually and spend hours upon hours just explaining and really deep, deep diving into all that I have wrestled with. But I know that I don't have the time for that. And I'm sure many of you don't have the time for that. This is really just what I've, I've really tried to soak in. Okay, what is the most important things that I've walked away with? And I know uh, my journey might look different than your journey. If this is, if this is something that helps you in any way, shape or form, if that's the case, great. If not, that's okay. My take is, is that again, I just want to express what I have learned. And if it does help you, if the Lord does use it to help you, then by his grace, great. That's awesome. But just know that if you walk away from watching this video or the, or the series of videos that I do on this matter, and you're convinced in your mind through your own workings of the scriptures, that this isn't the truth, then you have to hold to what you truly believe the scriptures are communicating. I don't think there is a contradiction, but I also know that, you know, for a long period of time, I would have not uh, been able to accept where I am now back then. So I understand and God gives grace and I don't think this is a primary issue. So just that's my take on it. The gospel is a primary issue. Who Jesus Christ is, is a primary issue. I think how we understand God working in salvation is not a primary issue, but it is a big topic. I think it's probably the top secondary issue and it matters. It, it 
greatly matters. We are gonna go into all of these things and they're really gonna compound off of each other. That was kind of the approach that, uh, as I started going through the scriptures and really trying to understand the context and really trying to understand things without some type of other voices trying to tell me what the text says, just asking, relying on the Holy Spirit, teach me what your word says, help me to see what your word says. This is kind of a summation of where I've now landed currently. And I know my journey is not over. I'm going to continue to to learn and to grow. Each video is going to be passing the baton to another runner to continue running that race. So in video two, we're going to talk about regeneration preceding faith. And is that supported in scripture? Obviously, I don't see that it is. And I, I think I have a pretty good defense for that. And then in video three, God's revealed and secret will. And this is the, the high concern that I have over decretal theology. Many people may not even be aware of even what that is. You might probably go start looking that up because it's probably going to be at least um, several weeks before I can get even video three out. It seems to be about a video once a week for me is, is where I can best do things, but we'll see. Video four is inference and context. One is added and one is removed. Once you start seeing these elements kind of come about, it's going to, I think you'll, you'll see things like you've never seen them before. I've not, I've, I've watched a lot of content since changing my position and I've not seen anyone do things in this particular way. Now, what has helped me may not help you. This may not be helpful for you. So I'm just, I'm going to lay that out there, but this is what I've seen as being some of the big, big things. And I think we'll, we'll try to keep each of these videos to an hour or less, hopefully less. And then the last video is why so many people believe in Calvinism. And I think that's really going to be, I think, an eye opener for many, because a lot of people don't realize what they're believing, why they're believing what they what they're believing. And really, it's an overall summary of how and why people do really hone in on the doctrines of grace, because I think not only the argumentation and the exegetical work that they present is very convincing. There's also a lot that we can, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil anything. There's just a lot that goes into doctrines of grace, Calvinism that provides itself a phenomenal case for that. This is the true way to interpret scripture. And so be on the lookout for that. That might be the one that really helps you the most, to be honest, who knows. But without further ado, let's dive into this video and we'll talk about total inability, predestination and election. So first, I don't wanna assume that everyone that's watching this video even knows what Calvinism is. Calvinism runs under the guise of numerous titles and it's good to be aware of what they are because you might not have ever heard of Calvinism or if you have, you might not have been able to associate it with other names and titles. So Reformed theology is a buzzword to help people uh, basically say that's just a different way of saying Calvinism. TULIP, which is the acronym for what Calvinism is, the five points of Calvinism, total, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. All of that systematic is within the TULIP acronym. Then there's decretal theology. Then there's determinism, and then there's Augustinianism. Some of these are never ever even mentioned. Doctrines of grace, that's probably the most popular one and it's probably definitely, you hear, hey, we believe in the doctrines of grace. What Christian does not believe in grace? We know, oh, doctrine matters and the doctrines of grace and how God has saved us. It is probably the softest way to explain that you believe in Calvinism. And in some, in some, ways please take this with good heart i think it is it is also the sneakiest way to tell people that they're really you're really being taught calvinism okay so they're all the same thing i've not heard anyone disagree with me on that all titles are different ways to reference the same theology theological system regarding soteriology so soteriology is the doctrine of salvation Specifically, it is how certain Christians interpret the scriptures, how God works in salvation. Preachers and teachers that believe in Calvinism, it's just good to be aware. If you're listening to one of these guys or one of these ministries, you are going to get Calvinism. You're going to get doctrines of grace. You're going to get reformed theology. Some might be from a Baptist bent. Some might be from a non-denominational bent. Some might be from a Southern 
um, Southern Baptist, it might be Presbyterian, even different denominations are going to all hold to this in some way, shape, or form. So you see John Piper, John MacArthur, Bodie Bachman, Paul Washer, Jonathan Edwards. Some of these guys are still living. Some of these guys are uh, have been long past. John Calvin, uh, Lorraine Botner, James Montgomery Boyce, Mark Dever, Kevin DeYoung, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Lincoln Duncan. You guys can see the list. Um, and there's many more that I didn't even list on here. Charles Spurgeon uh, would be one that's not on the list. Douglas Moo, who is one of the guys behind the NIV translation. There are Bible translations to be aware of that are also done by Calvinists. Most Bible translations today, newer translations, are actually translated by Calvinists. The ESV is a big one. And the ESV actually uses their lens, their interpretation of Reformed theolo theology, and actually do they do change some words to fit their theology. Even when the, the Greek or the Hebrew doesn't say that you should be able to do it, they, they are actually changing the words, which does actually change the theology of what the original Hebrew and the Greek have actually done. The ESV has done that. That's another video, I'm just letting you know. The NASB, the NIV, the Geneva Bible, which obviously I think many would probably realize that's that's true. Uh, the Legacy Standard Bible, the, the one written or translated by John MacArthur, which is basically a uh, update to the NASB, also done. And there are verses in there that they do put in Calvinistic interpretations in, in the text. They're interpreting it and they're able to put some things in there that fit their theology. And so not a big fan, just letting you know. Ones that are not, King James, New King James, those are two of my favorites. Just because you have a particular theology doesn't mean that you that gives you license to change what the original author intended. When you are actually changing actual words to fit your theology, I, I do have a problem with that. And then to call it a literal translation, I think there's a disconnect, and that's being very gracious to say that. If you don't know what Calvinism is, I think you should be aware of what it is. And so this video, these video series will help you with that. If you are aware of what it is, I think it will help you see this is how they interpret the scriptures. And I'm going to contrast with how I think people should interpret the scriptures. If you do subscribe to Calvinism, I think this will give you some opportunity to be challenged on what you believe. And again, it's it's not for me to say that I'm right and to say that you're wrong. It's just that what I believe I've found in the scriptures to be true. I want to share this with you and I hope that it will actually be a blessing to you. Okay. So that's just know that that's my heart in sharing this. The hardest thing for me to admit to myself was that I could be wrong. As I started going through this and I started diving in, I found out there were some verses that were used out of context to adhere to Calvinism. And there are Calvinists who would also agree that that is the case with, with some of this. There's enough evidence here that's making me question, making me doubt what I believe and how I've been believing what the scriptures communicate and teach. So I had to ask myself really hard questions and I really exhort you to do the same. One of them was, is my theology based on wrestling with the scriptures myself or is my theology based on men who have taught me how to understand the Bible? That was a really tough pill to swallow. The Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher that we have. I relied a lot on men and commentary sets and I felt convinced in my mind that they had worked and did the work themselves and they sound so convincing, it sounds so logical, it sounds so true, and it must be, it must be true. And I appeal to that. Obviously, I think any true believer wants to submit to the text. Every believer wants to submit to whatever God's word says, and you will be obedient to whatever God's word says. That should be the heart of any Christian. And there are things in scripture when I was a Calvinist that I personally, I just didn't like, but I submitted to it because you know what? I am not God. It is, and he is so much bigger than I am. And I will worship him because he is God. I am not. And if this is true, I'm going to embrace it wholeheartedly because that it's the truth as I saw it to be in the text. So my question and my admonition to you is to ask, could you be wrong? Could you have been taught the Bible incorrectly? From a general standpoint, there's a very high probability of that of both those answers being correct. Have you went to the scriptures yourself and wrestled through the text, eliminating your presuppositions 
and rely on the Holy Spirit to lead you to the truth. There are so many, I don't have the stats right now, but I've seen the stats and they're they're appalling. How many Christians actually open their Bible outside of a Sunday morning in church and they go through their whole week not spending any time, not, not no audio, no just picking up their Bible or anything, okay? The Bible is the words of truth, the word of life for us. We need the word. It is how we trust and follow him. So let's go into the first section here. Total inability, predestination, and election, the Augustinian lens of scripture. And I, you have, you've heard me say this several times already. You're probably like, what is Augustinian lens? I'm gonna explain that. Is there a difference between depravity and total depravity? That's the first big question that you need to ask. Is there a difference between depravity and total depravity? I'm going to define it here in the next point. What is depravity? Well, the Bible communicates depravity, wickedness, it's moral corruption. All humanity has been affected by sin. So yes, the Bible confirms this over and over again. I'll have some verses here in the next few slides. Total depravity, by definition, would mean someone is completely depraved to the very core and does nothing good at all. Now we know that that's not what the Calvinist believes when they talk about total depravity. In fact, I've not heard one Calvinist say that someone is as morally wicked as we possibly can be. But many Calvinists would, would say that humans are not totally depraved right, as they could be due to God's common grace. Many would define total depravity really as total inability, which is why I'm lab labeling it total inability, but many of you may know it better as total depravity. So this changes the meaning of total depravity from being as wicked as one could be into being completely unable to respond in repentance and faith unless God does a regenerating work first. So before we look into it uh, in the next video, we need to see if the scriptures validate the idea of total inability since the fall, right? So depravity. Depravity emphasizes that all fall short of the glory of God. We see that in Romans 3.23. That our sin has separated us from God, Isaiah 59.2. The scriptures tell us that we are dead in our trespasses, Ephesians 2.1. This deadness typically refers to spiritual death. And which is the reality of every person who is not in Christ. Everyone who is not in Christ is spiritually dead and will burn in hell as a result of not being in Christ. Depravity would emphasize Jesus' words in John 3 of the importance that people must be born again. Jesus was telling Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. In order to see the kingdom, you must be born again. In order to enter the kingdom, you must be born again. Sinners, in order to inherit eternal life with Christ, must be born again. This is a work of the Spirit, and sinners can do nothing to merit it on their own. The fall back in Genesis 3 brought sin into the world, and everyone since Adam have all sinned. Everyone that's a Christian and faithful to the Word of God, Holy Scriptures, the Holy Bible, would affirm everything that I just said. Here's where total depravity adds something into this. Is it also referenced as total inability, which is not only emphasizes all points in the biblical definition of depravity in what it conveys, which I just mentioned, but would also add that being spiritually dead also makes it impossible to believe, which means it makes it impossible for anyone to have faith. So in order to have faith in Christ, God must grant regeneration first, and then he grants the sinner faith to believe and they are born again. So both views espouse the fact that sinners do not contribute to their salvation, but total inability adds the element of not even being able to believe. And that if you do believe by your own will, you are performing a work. That's what the Calvinists would say. They, they would say that if you believe out of your own free will, that is a work. And the scriptures talk very heavily about can't work towards salvation. Total inability would emphasize that there is a bondage of the will. This is what took place at the fall. That your will is never to believe the gospel, never to believe in Christ. Even if the gospel is preached to you, unless God intervenes, unless God provides regeneration and, in, and deposits faith, 
to you, you will not desire, you will not believe. That's what the Calvinist argues. So since this is the case that God has to grant regeneration first, knowing that not all people will be saved, God does not save everyone by his choice. Because we, we know, Jesus said that the road to heaven is narrow and the road to destruction is wide. The gate to destruction is wide and many go that way. We know that, that many will not trust in Christ. That's the majority. Most of the people are not going to be saved. The Calvinists would say that they are not saved because God did not choose them to believe. He did not elect them or select them or predestine, predestinate them to believe. This is true. God owes no one any mercy. And this is a big argument that, that the Calvinists will make. God owes no one any mercy whatsoever. We are all deserving of death. We are all deserving of judgment. That's that's 100% true. Both, but does the scriptures teach us that depravity and the fall brought about an inability to even believe or recognize that we are sinners? That's the big question that we need to ask. And that's the big question that I asked when I started wrestling through this. Does the Bible actually teach that the fall actually brought about the inability to believe and trust in God? So here are some total depravity go-to verses. These are probably the go-to verses that emphasize the doctrine of total depravity, which means that they are humans are completely unable to believe the gospel and, and believe on Jesus unless God grants them regeneration and faith to believe. Pause the video here. You can look at these references. They're all there for you to look up and explore. I'm not going to go through all of them. So the problem with total depravity, this is where I have some contentions. You don't have to look long in the scriptures after the fall to see the story of Cain and Abel. Many know that Cain became angry because God accepted Abel, his brother's sacrifice, and not his. You will notice that God did not deal with Cain as if Cain was totally depraved. This is a big key thing, and we get this right out of the gates in Genesis chapter 4, okay? Did God treat Cain as if Cain was completely unable to unable to believe. That's the big question. God tells Cain that if he does well, that he will be accepted. Then he warns Cain that sin is knocking at your door and that he, Cain, should rule over his sin. Now, how in the world can an unregenerate sinner rule over their sin? How can they rule over their sin? And why would God tell Cain that he is able to do well and be accepted if it was completely impossible for him to be able to do well and be accepted. He talks to Cain as if he does have the ability. 1 John 3, 10 and 11 tell us that Cain's deeds were evil, but Abel's was righteous. The Bible goes on to tell us that other individuals were also righteous. Noah, Enoch, and Abel were all righteous in God's eyes, as the text tells us. How could all humanity post-fall be totally depraved or totally unable, yet God considers them to be righteous? And contextually, they're walking in obedience and following God. That's what, that's what that means. But nowhere, nowhere at all does it say that God had to grant them regeneration in order for them to be righteous. Okay, so I think it's just a very, very big point right out of the gates in the book of Genesis. Jesus also affirms that Abel was righteous in Matthew 23, 35. Enoch pleased God in Hebrews 11, 4. Noah was a just man, walked with God, righteous in the sight of the Lord. Genesis 6, 9, 7, 1, Ezekiel 14, 14, verse 20, uh, Hebrews 11, 7. And I just want you to see the pattern here that we go on. Abraham has integrity of heart, we see in Genesis 20. Faithful heart towards God in Nehemiah. A man of faith who obeyed and feared God in Genesis 22, 12. Lot was a righteous man. Joseph, Genesis 39. Moses, John. Joshua, Caleb, Job, Phineas, David, Daniel, Hananiah, 
Josiah. And there are Old Testament and New Testament references to some of these men, all declared righteous before God. And it's amazing. Then you have some New Testament examples, Zacharias and Elizabeth, Simeon, John the Baptist, Joseph, the husband of Mary, Cornelius, the Gentile centurion in Acts 10. We're talking there is a whole host of people that were recognized by God as righteous. They were doing what was right in the sight of God. And God continually gives these examples of these people. Not that they had earned any righteousness of the, like they're not earning righteousness. It never ever says that they earned any righteousness, but because they did trust in the one true God, because they did, they were counted as righteous. They had the ability to trust in that not because God granted it to them and only to them, the text never ever says that, never says that. So these are big points that I think need to be emphasized. Now we get the Lazarus analogy problem. The Lazarus analogy, this is also a big uh, thing for the Calvinist. So here's the, the problem with the Lazarus analogy. So first of all, the Calvinists will say they love to use this analogy in the Gospels where Lazarus is dead. They basically take Lazarus's physical death and they contrast it or parallel it to our spiritual deadness. They point out that just as Lazarus was physically dead in the grave until Jesus rose him to life, the very same is needed for spiritual life. Sinners are spiritually in the grave and have no ability to recognize that they are dead. It's a pretty convincing argument to say that. And there is so much in what I just said that I actually do agree with. Are humans spiritually dead prior to being saved? Yes, they are. But nowhere in scripture does it use the example of Lazarus to speak about salvation. You can't use, you can't use a storyline in the Bible, a narrative account that has nothing to do about salvation in terms of Lazarus and being risen from the dead, and then make that be about how God works in salvation because it's not there. In fact, What's ironic is the exact opposite is there. Because as you see, if you read the account, Jesus waits two days to go visit Lazarus. Why? Because he wanted people to know that he was absolutely dead. We see this even confirmed. The Bible tells us he waits two days. Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, if you would have come here sooner, he could have been saved. Like he would, you would have been able to heal him, but because you didn't come early enough, he has died. And now by this point, there's probably a smell that has taken place. And you know, there was concerns of him rolling open the, the stone that held him in the tomb because they were worried about the smell that would come from it. Because that's how, that's how dead he was by this point, uh, that his body was starting to decay and, and smell. And the reason why he waits is so that one, People would know that him being risen from the dead was a miracle. But the reason, the reason why that he did this is so that they would believe. It's amazing. Why would Jesus, if Jesus, if, if the Calvinist interpretation of the scriptures are actually true, Jesus, knowing all things, knows he doesn't have to wait so that people believe he could show up whenever and he can grant that regeneration and faith to believe to the people that he has already pre-selected and pre-elected before the foundation of the world. He could do that if he wanted to. He doesn't do this. It's nothing. It's not there in the text. He waits so that they will believe. He waits so that they will believe. So here's the big question. It says, are we spiritually dead? The answer is yes. Does any sinner need regenerated or born again in order to inherit eternal life? Again, yes. Are we truly unable to save ourselves? Once again, yes. We are unable to save ourselves. Does spiritually dead mean that we cannot believe? And what I have read in the scriptures affirms that no, that is not the case. The scriptures never say that we are unable to believe. Never, ever, ever does it say that we are unable to believe. There are countless verses that say actually that we can believe. Now here's the big question. Is faith a work? 
And the answer again is no, it's not. The New Testament continually expresses that faith is the opposite of works. That's what it says on a, on a just continual basis. Look at Romans 4 and 5, just to emphasize a particular text. Look at Ephesians 2. Faith is the opposite of works. No, what I want to emphasize is that God's word, the gospel, is sufficient to save. And here are verses that you can look at and read through. I'm going to just pick a couple out here. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you look at all of Romans 10, especially uh, starting in verses 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, there's this emphasis that there needs to be a preacher, there needs to be those to send the message of the gospel. How will people know if there's not a preacher? How will they know if that preacher doesn't proclaim the gospel and then they hear it? Hear, faith comes by hearing the word, hear it and you believe it and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that he raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible affirms that faith is something that we can have a verse that's not even on here is Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone, everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile is what that means. I am affirmed that the word of God and the gospel message is the means in which God has ordained to be how anyone can be saved. That's why the Great Commission is so vital. And one of the things that I didn't have prepared in here, but I did want to bring it out, maybe now is a good point to do this, is that I do think that Calvinism, whether it is consciously or subconsciously, I don't like using that lingo, just so you know, just from my biblical counseling background, but I know a lot of people get that type of language, so that's why I'm using it. Whether consciously or subconsciously, people that believe in Calvinism just don't do a lot of gospel preaching. They don't do a lot of focus on the Great Commission and proclaiming the gospel and making disciples. Um, it, it, it's what I see. It's, it's, it's evident. And many, I've heard many, many reformed Calvinist doctrines of grace adherence say the exact same thing. There is an issue. And I think it's, I think it's that systematic of Calvinism. It's not all. And for, for a lot of people that I know personally, don't take that as a personal attack to you. It is just what I know of from a general sense, anyone that does adhere to the systematic. All right. So dead. Does dead mean unable to believe? This is the Augustinian lens of scripture. Okay, one of the go-to passages that most Calvinists will actually refer to is 1 Corinthians 2.14. And so it says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. Does this passage actually teach total depravity? Does it explain that this, is this the evidence that we have the need to affirm that total depravity is true? I will admit that on the surface for many years, this verse convinced me of that. But is this the true context in which Paul writes to the Corinthians? Or is this verse only applicable in that understanding when we isolate it from the context. So that's that's the big question. So there are two big problems with the Calvinist interpretation of 1 Corinthians 2.14. In order for it to be the case that Paul is making that total depravity is true because of this verse as it's interpreted by the Calvinists, it, you have to infer that onto the text and isolate that scripture by itself because nowhere else in the context does this verse make sense to that end. Because two, contextually, what Paul is communicating in, second, in 1 Corinthians 2.14 is this. Paul is affirming that 
that that uh, these Corinthians are believers. He establishes that right from the get-go. That these are Christian believers in the city of Corinth. Then he goes on to basically exhort them and admonish them for the fact that they are living like the world. They are living of the flesh. They are worldly minded. They are carnally minded. And he uses these expressions interchangeably. And what you'll see is that he also uses another expression interchangeably with this uh, worldly minded, fleshly minded, and then he adds also the natural man. Okay, he uses this expression to emphasize the fact that not, it's not that these Corinthian believers, unregenerate people, or that he needed to teach them this. Uh, within this verse, that they're unre- that unregenerate people don't know the things of God. No, and what's what's crazy to me is that I would say that a lot of Calvinist churches, Reformed churches, doctrines of grace held churches, do exposition in their approach. Yet when they get to a verse like this, they've been taught to see it a very particular way, and it and. And it's almost like you can just pluck this verse out by itself, and that's what it means. That's not what the text is saying. Paul is saying this, when you Corinthian believers, you being baby Christians, are acting in the ways of the world, when you're acting like the natural man, you are not going to be pleasing to God. You're not going to be walking in the spirit if you are walking in the flesh. Every Christian, after any person that's been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone and now are regenerated and now have the new heart and affections, they still have the flesh and they still can choose to operate in the flesh. And he is reprimanding them for doing that at a, at, at very many levels. And he calls them uh, basically that you're, you're worldly, you're fleshly, you're natural um, in that, in that way. And, um, you can't even you can't even comprehend the deeper things of God because you you basically are baby Christians and can only accept spiritual milk. Paul is not contrasting the elect versus the non-elect. That is not there in the context whatsoever. And it'd be really weird for Paul to just stop all of that and then just for one verse to say, oh, and by the way, Corinthian believers. Did you know that someone who is not saved basically is totally depraved? Did you know this? Okay, well, anyways, back to what I was saying before to you. It's, it, it doesn't make sense in in the context of what he's saying. Calvinist has to insert this into the text, and they do that because they have the presupposition, the base, the lenses of Augustinian lenses on as they read the text. They have their total depravity glasses on when they get to a verse like this. And that is why people see it this way. So this leads to another big and important question that we need to ask. Was this the way that people believed about the scriptures since the early church and since the inception of the church? Is there perhaps verifiable evidence that the doctrine of total depravity was ever brought into the church outside of God's word? And I want to tell you that the answer is 100% yes. The doctrine of total depravity was not taught by the early fathers. It was not brought into the church and accepted by the church until at least the fourth or fifth century. Many of you might have been aware of what's called Gnosticism. And I think probably many of you are probably less well known of the fact of Manichaeanism or Manichaeanism. There's different ways of maybe saying that. Basically, what this, these two symbols, the top one is Gnosticism, the bottom is Manichaeanism or Manichaeanism. In fact, there are New Testament writers fighting against Gnosticism. Augustine of Hippo, or Augustine of Hippo, of or Saint Augustine, however you want to say his name. I'm going to go probably, I'm going to use it interchangeably as I go along. Augustine was a Manichaean, which was an offshoot of Gnosticism for 10 plus years before converting to Christianity. Both religions, Manichaeanism and Gnosticism, are esoteric in their thought and practice. Esoteric means that there's this focus on secret knowledge, among many other concerns that I, I 
see as very unbiblical. Gnosticism means having knowledge. This is a religious system that came about in the first century among the Jews and the Christians. They emphasized on personal spiritual knowledge above orthodox teaching. So they had the secret knowledge that the Christians and the Jews did not have. Okay, that's what they taught. The belief system, again, is esoteric and mystical, focusing on anything that is material is corrupt, and anything that is spiritual is good. Anything that is material is considered to be depraved, and anything that is spiritual is considered to be good or divine. This is a hidden divinity and principal element of salvation to be directly hidden. The focus is less on sin and repentance and more on enlightenment. So they were very kind of heady, if you will. There was this secret knowledge that you could have of understanding who God is and how he works in salvation. And they believe that people, as they are, because we're material beings, we are completely corrupted and there's nothing good in us. No one even has the ability to believe in God in and of themselves. They believe that God had to basically elect them to salvation in order to believe. And God only does that to a secret group of people. Does this sound a lot like Calvinism? Because if it does, I'm going to tell you, yes, it, it, it very much does. Now, Manichaeanism came a little bit later, developed in the third century through the prophet Manny. As an offshoot of Gnosticism, Manichaeanism focused on the struggle between the spiritual good and the world of light against the evil material world of darkness. Manny's teachings was intended to combine, succeed, and surpass Christianity, Buddhism, Hellenistic and Rabbinic Judaism and Gnosticism. This system thrived between the 3rd and the 7th century. Manny declared to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And there's so much more that we could go into just on this. Augustine of Hippo is well known by many historians as well as his own testimony to be found in his writings, admitting to that prior to his conversion of Christianity, he was a leader in the Manichaean uh, religion for nearly 10 years. Augustine established the following conclusions found in the church today. So these are the things that he is attested to basically bringing into the church. Original sin, the Augustinian view of predestination, which we're gonna go into next, the gift of perseverance, the absence of good, sacramental character, all millennialism, divine illumination, and actually quite a bit more. Augustine changed his view on Christianity numerous times, changing his stance on soteriology at least three times. There is much to respect about Augustine, especially his view on preaching and his devout dedication to preaching nearly 10,000 sermons in his lifetime. That's, I mean, he was adamant and fervent and had a lot of zeal, That a lot of things that I wish a lot of pastors nowadays actually had for the gospel that way. He had, he upholded scripture very, he esteemed it very highly. All of those things are great things that I want to pay homage to him for and hold him in high respect for that. Every pastor, every preacher needs to do the exact same. He believed it was his job to interpret the Bible. Augustine used the concepts of material as evil from Manichaeanism and Gnosticism and aspects of Stoicism into his concepts of original sin and developed what we now know as total depravity. Augustine first converted to Christianity. He didn't believe this. He actually believed in free will, is best known as for the first four centuries of the church is what was taught. However, but it was over a debate with Pelagius that he shifted to this type of thought and interpretation. When Augustine converted to Christianity, he believed that God's grace is what saves a person, but held to human responsibility and a person's ability to respond to the gospel by faith. Pelagius, believing that man was good by nature, could choose God because of free will. Pelagius then set up this false premise against Augustine, stating that they believed the same thing because they both start with faith and free will. 
hey, Augustine, you believe in free will, just like I believe in free will. I believe humans are born good, and you believe humans are born corrupt. There's an inherited guilt, and there's a sin nature right from the start. And so because you believe that th that that people start off corrupt and sinful, and I believe that people start off good, how can you hold to a free will position? How can anything bad believe something that is good, that is Jesus Christ in the gospel? And so this is, he, he conflated an argument that brought Augustine back to his Manichaeanism roots, which is stemmed in Gnosticism and believing that material is bad, spiritual is good. Anyone that is corrupt, anyone that is depraved cannot choose anything that is good. Then something came about with infant baptism. And there's a whole story here. I don't know if I'm going to get into it. I'll try to sum summarize it very, very quickly, but something that I would encourage you to look into. Augustine believed in infant baptism. He believed that it was necessary for the inherited guilt from the parents to be washed away from their parents. But basically he, he figured out that that's not going to ultimately save someone because as they got older, they started living like the devil. And as a result, they are not, they're not showing any fruit that there's been saved. They've been saved. So there must be a conversion that takes place. And because man is corrupt and because material is depraved, anything that is bad and corrupt and depraved cannot choose God. And because inherited guilt and the baptism of that doesn't wash away the sins, God has to do a regenerating work to help someone come to faith because, again, material bad, spiritual good, that must mean that God is the one who brings people to salvation. But God doesn't bring everybody to salvation. So what he must do is he actually must elect certain people to be saved. He must predestine certain people to be saved because of total depravity. Do you see how this thought process gets worked out and then believed upon. Can I now affirm that in scripture? And let me tell you, there are a ton of verses that one can go to to affirm this systematic. But I want to tell you this is that you never, ever, ever, ever want to go to the scriptures and say, I believe this about the Bible. Now, can I see that in the Bible? Something that we need to be aware of is that Augustine did not know Greek or Hebrew. He was not well versed in this. He knew Latin. And then you've got this Manichaeanism that is rooted in his past, then bringing that onto the text because Pelagius sets up this false premise that he says, how can you believe that man is bad but can choose something that is good? I believe that humankind is good and can choose something that is good. And that starts the whole cycle of bringing back the Manichaeanism into the church which he established. Questions that we need to ask ourselves as we evaluate the doctrines that Augustine taught. Was Augustine so determined to oppose Pelagius that he was willing to insert Manichaeanism and Gnosticism into his Christian understanding? It's just a question, but we need to answer it. Was there really three to four hundred years after Jesus' ascension that people did not properly understand soteriology until Augustine came about? Was it just assumed that it was free will and then Augustine basically teaches the now the correct view of what the scriptures are saying? I highly, highly doubt this is the case. Biggest question we need to ask is, was Augustine right? What, what he taught, is it found in the text? Let's not just focus on, on total depravity. Let's move over into something else that he taught and he brought into the church, which is predestination. Now, Augustine didn't bring predestination into the Bible, but he did bring a particular interpretation of predestination into the church. Here is the biblical interpretation of predestination. There are only four times in the New Testament that the word or the expression of predestination or predestined occurs. There's two times in Romans, two times in Ephesians. Both times, predestined means determined beforehand. What is determined beforehand is the big question. Is it ever predetermined to salvation? 
a lost person predetermined to salvation? Is is it is that explicitly taught in the text? The answer is no. What predestined is explicitly in the text is that a Christian will be predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what we see in Romans. Or in Ephesians, a Christian, a believer, will be predestined to have spiritual blessings. And if you, and if you take the position that I, I think lean on, if you've watched my Ephesians video, that the predestination that's taking place is the decree and the ordaining of the apostles. I didn't make this point very clear in my Ephesians video, but I, I would be perfectly fine holding to one of two positions. One is that verses 2 through 12 are talking about the apostles, which is where I emphasized the book of Ephesians. And I think it's a very fascinating and a very compelling case. If you've not seen the video yet, go watch it. I think it, there's some strong arguments to make the case that verses two, Ephesians 1 verses 2 through 12 are all about Paul and the other apostles and God ordaining them to be the messengers to fulfill the Great Commission and spread the gospel out. They were the first ones ordained by God to deliver the message. And that was God's ordained plan, predetermined, predestined plan for his apostles, his elected special apostles. So I think there's a lot of potential for that view to be there. I can't be dogmatic on it. So the other position that I think is almost is equally valid is that Paul is including the Ephesians in verses 2 through 12, and he's also including in a general sense any believer. But the point is, is that if you take this, then the emphasis really is not on before the foundation of the world, as verse 4 talks about in Ephesians, it's more so in Christ. Paul is writing to the Ephesian believers that they are in Christ, and because they are in Christ, they will God has predestined all believers to have spiritual blessings. And there's a spiritual blessing. Salvation is a spiritual blessing. Obviously, glorification is a spiritual blessing. It doesn't really specify what the spiritual blessings ultimately are for them that way, other than the fact that there will be some. I think either position are going to be valid positions, but what is clear, and I think is very clear, in Ephesians 1, it's not talking about God electing certain people to salvation. You have to, have to, have to put on the predestination lenses of Augustine Augustinian lenses into the text. You have to do that. And again, if you subscribe to total depravity as interpreted by John Calvin, Augustine of Hippo, then yes, you will read Ephesians 1 like that. You will read Romans 9 like that. You're going to, you're, that's what you're going to do, right? Here is the Augustinian predestination interpretation. Augustine originally believed that in the biblical definition of predestination. However, but his false previous religious affiliations and philosophies crept back in as a result of believing several wrong presuppositions. The first error is that all babies born after Adam had inherited guilt that needed removed through infant baptism. Tell me where in the scriptures it communicates that anybody has inherited guilt. In fact, the scriptures communicate a lot in the Old Testament that every person is guilty on account of their own sin, not because of the sin that has been inherited to them. So inherited guilt, I believe, is a man-made doctrine from Augustine. The place where you would believe that inherited guilt would be clear would be right at the fall. I mean, that would be the most obvious point. God is laying out the curses that are going to be the result of your sin. Here they are. And he lays it out there. Nowhere does he say that there's inherited guilt. Contrasting his Manichaeanism philosophy of material bad and spiritual good, thus resulting in all humans being totally unable to respond to anything good, even the gospel message, he came up with the theology that God must predestine people to salvation. He also deduced that not all are saved, so only the elect are saved. And there's plenty of passages in scripture that communicate that not all will be saved. Uh, a Christian should not believe in universalism. Historians and even Calvinist ones also admit that Augustine was the inventor of this new understanding of predestination, and yet they still actually believe that he is correct. 
they on one hand affirm that he brought it into the church and created this interpretation and acknowledge that he is the one who brought this interpretation in and they still believe it. I I mean, that that's just kind of mind blowing to me that you think that the apostles didn't bring about the correct understanding and that for three, 400 plus years, everyone else had it wrong until Augustine came along, it just doesn't make any sense. And here's something that I think is concerning as well, is that many seminaries across the world use a particular book called Historical Theology, written by Alistair E. McGrath, in which he also admits the following. On page 36 of this book, McGrath states, Augustine developed a doctrine of predestination. The term predestination refers to God's original and eternal decision to save some and not others. And I can't help but think that most of these young men that are going into the ministry and getting taught the Bible through seminaries and Bible colleges and so on, that when they sit in a class and they now see that this is what predestination means. The impressionable minds, all they want to do is they want to serve God. They want to go proclaim the gospel and teach me the Bible so that I can go help other people trust and love Jesus. And now you're telling me that this is how, this is what predestination means. So anytime I come across predestination in the Bible, this is what the interpretation is. Tell me that that is not going to make an impact on certain men that are going to be prepared for ministry. So when they now go to the text, they can't do anything other. It's really hard for them now not to see that predestination means that God has predetermined people to salvation. They've been taught this is how you are to read the text. If they do good logic and reason, if they do look at the context in which things are written, and they really work at it, they're really a Berean to really study it well, they don't fall for it. But those that just are sponges that want to learn and just trust the people that are instructing them, those people that were instructed in probably the same way, believe it. That's how it happens. On the contrary though, biblical election does not place its understanding on individuals that are selected to salvation, but rather individuals selected to service. The apostles were predestined to be the vessels God used to carry out his gospel to the world. Yet even in God's choosing them, one fell away. Judas did, right? To understand Judas is to understand it one of two ways, either God predestined Judas to betray Jesus and commit suicide, or Judas chose to do wrong because he wanted to do wrong. But it was his choice to do what he did. It wasn't God's choice to make him do what he did, right? Does that make sense? I'll have you do a little exercise. If you go to all of the passages in where the Bible communicates election, I want you to View it as service, elected to a service. Focus on that and tell me how much better the context actually is versus election to salvation. And if that's what the context really is. Here's John Calvin on predestination. By predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God by which he determined with himself. Whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man, all are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. And accordingly, as each has been created for one or other of these ends, we say that he has been predestined to life or to death. This is what also would be called double predestination which John Calvin believed in, that God not only elects people to salvation and just doesn't pass over the others, he actually elects people to damnation as well. This is found in the Institutes of the Christian Religion, as you see on those pages in that in section five. John Calvin on predestination also said, uh, and this is an emphasis really more so on how John Calvin really emphasized Augustine. Augustine is so holy within me that if I wish to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all of the fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings. This is also found in the Institutes of the Christian Religion. 
And honestly, this statement is really kind of scary if you if you really think about it. Almost like there's a man worship o- over Augustine and what he did. It's said that one out of every four pages written from Calvin's Institutes is a reference or a quotation from Augustine. Calvin freely acknowledges that his authority was Augustine. And that's in chapter 22 of the Institutes in book three. Guys, I, I, I'm, I'm being dead serious here. That's absolutely scary that you have someone who is revered as one of the greatest reformers. It's where Calvinism gets its name from. And here he is saying that he is basically, his whole theology, it, he's completely satisfied in his theology and it could all be written through what Augustine did. Not the Bible, even though I know he thinks that Augustine gets the Bible right, but I don't think that he does. And the scary part is, is that um, if you if you look at, and I'm not even going to get into the character of John Calvin. There are some things in history that if you do some digging, the character of John Calvin is 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 quite concerning. Just know that not all reformers believed in Calvinism. They didn't believe in these doctrines that Augustine brought into the church. So that's another point to make. But let me go into other Augustine beliefs. Augustine was the father of all millennialism. We talked about that. He interpreted prophecy as allegory. Taught that the Catholic Church, we're talking the Roman Catholic Church, is the kingdom of God. He taught that Mary was sinless. He believed in purgatory. He believed in infant baptism, washed the inherited guilt. Unbaptized infants were lost and cursed. He made statements such as this, I should not believe the gospel unless I were moved to do so by the authority of the, and this is the Roman Catholic Church. It's not, Catholic sometimes is a reference to the church at large. Um, He's referring to the Roman Catholic Church. So he's um, ex- um, he's exalting tradition over scripture here. He changed his soteriological positions three different times. He created his own form of predestination. He brought in Manichaeanism from the total depravity element into the church and into uh, what he believes the Bible communicates on depravity and so much more. This is who the reformers heavily relied on, not just John Calvin, Martin Luther, and many others in the Reformation. And we see these guys as heroes, and in some ways that they are, but we also then think that because they fought against the the tragedies and the, de- the, the wickedness of the Roman church at the time when the Reformation took place, that they had good theology in all aspects. They did not. So that's, that's the area of, of issue. And I know most Calvinists would say that they don't agree with everything that the Reformers believed in, but they believe in enough of it, and in particular, Calvinism, to agree that this is the truth. And that's concerning. So my summation is that if you believe in Augustine and what his influence and teachings have brought into the church through Calvinism and more, I'm inclined to say that those that align with Augustine are more connected to Catholicism, Gnosticism, Manichaeanism, and Stoicism rather than the Bible. I mean, you you really, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And I hate to be that bold to say such things, but that's exactly what you are believing. You are believing, when you believe in Calvinism, you are believing offshoots and versions of Gnosticism, Manichaeanism, Stoicism, and even some elements, depending on how far your your reformed beliefs are, into Catholicism, which is amazing to me. All right, let's talk about election. This is election through the Augustinian lens of scripture. Election to salvation or election to something else. I've already kind of shared some of this stuff, but I want to go into it more. Most of the time when Calvinists see the phrase election or chosen in the Bible, they assume the text is speaking of God's decree to foreordain certain individuals unconditionally to salvation. Election never is contextually mentioned in reference to salvation. Never. Okay? This is something that the Calvinist has to eisegete into the text. 
2 Thessalonians 2.13 is the only text that appears to mention God's election for certain people to salvation at face value by itself. Let me say this. It's the only text that appears to mention God's election for certain people to salvation at face value. Okay, this is the only text that you, you could say that explicitly communicates it. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. There it is. There's election. Without a doubt, there you have it. But hold up. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. Let's wait and see if that is what contextually this is talking about. There are several notes to make. If you are reading from the beginning as from before the foundation of the world, first of all, you are then misreading the text. It says from the beginning, not from before the foundation of the world. Okay? From the beginning means from the beginning. What is the beginning? That's the question that we need to ask. From what beginning are we talking about here? And contextually, we learn that from the beginning is from the beginning of Paul's ministry. We're talking about a from the beginning in time, contextually. Paul is trying to help and warn the Thessalonian church about certain people who try to forge falsehoods and write false letters to them. A lot of false letters were written to different churches to disdain the gospel's message. What, I mean, that's obviously what Satan would be doing, right? Paul continues his warning in a future sense as well in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 and 2. The aspect of salvation that Paul references to these Thessalonians is found in this statement. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together with him. This is a future salvation to those who are in Christ, in him. Okay? There are many aspects of salvation. One of them is glorification. That is the final result of anyone's salvation in Christ is, is, is glorification. Contextually, Paul is referring to glorification since he started speaking about being gathered together with Christ. We know that these passages, what's going on in the Thessalonian church is there's this concern that Jesus had already come, these letters that Jesus has already come. And everyone was was like, well, what's the point now? What is the point? If Jesus has already came and he's, and he's brought his people, we're left here. What is the point? And Paul's warning them saying, no, the end has not come yet. The man of lawlessness, the man of sin has not been yet revealed. And Jesus has not come back yet. But he will come back. And when he does, you will be saved in a final aspect of glorification. That's what he's emphasizing. Then Paul moves to letting them know about a deception that they need to be prepared for. 2 Thessalonians 10, 12, this speaks of the Antichrist and his rise to power. Paul says this has not happened yet. Then he shares that the people who do not receive the love of the truth are not those preordained to not believe in the truth, but those who choose to reject the truth. That's what Paul communicates. He doesn't say, hey, guess what? These people that are writing these letters and these people that are not listening to the truth, they were preordained to not believe the truth, as the Calvinists would, would interpret. No, they are rejecting the truth by their own admission, their own will. That's what they're choosing to do. So if you download the PDF where there is a list every time the Bible uses the phrase election or chosen or chose, you will see something, I think, pretty astonishing. 10 out of 224 verses, less than 5% of all the verses that talk about election, chosen, chose, in Scripture are texts that could be conflated as Calvinist passages. Luke 18.7, John 15.16, John 15.19, Romans 8.33, Ephesians 1.4, 1 Thessalonians 1.4, Titus 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Peter 1.2, 1, 1 Peter 2.9, and Revelation 17.14. Out of the 224 passages, do, do it yourself. Look at the PDF and, and tell me contextually that 
any other passage would be affirmation for God electing certain people to salvation other than those 10 verses I just brought up. And if you contextually go and examine those scriptures, you'll find that out of those 10, only two could actually mean that God ordains from eternity past. And that's Ephesians 1 verse 4 and 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. I've already covered Ephesians 1, 4 in my previous video. I shared a little bit already in this video about that matter. So I am convinced, and, and hopefully you are too, that that verse does not mean that. So then we only have one text to go to. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. And there's several letters that kind of start this way. The election that Paul knows about is their specific service. We see this in verses 8 through 10. This is Paul communicating that these Thessalonian believers were chosen to spread the gospel in the area they are in. It says, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had with you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Nowhere in the text of Scripture contextually communicates Augustine's Gnostic Manichaeanism uh, election to salvation to save certain people from before the foundation of the world. It's not there. It's there if you put the lenses on and you believe in the systematic. You have to believe in total depravity. You won't get there. You won't get there if you don't believe in total depravity. You won't believe God elects people to salvation unless you believe in total depravity. Total depravity is a must. And it's really the domino that if you don't believe in total depravity, you're not going to believe in the other five points, most likely. Definitely the next three. Uh, you might believe in perseverance of the saints to some element in terms of an eternal security aspect of things, but um, not in other words. And and that's something else I didn't have, I didn't uh, develop or put time into putting into this video. But Augustine also not only believed that infant baptism was necessary to wash away inherited guilt, there needed to be an election by God, but then he also actually believed that God had to give the gift of perseverance. So there is three different moments in a believer's life that God has to, like, one is an infant baptism, which that work of baptism washes away the inherited guilt. Then there is an election by God predestined before the foundation of the world to save someone. But even then, Augustine didn't stop there. He actually believed, furthermore, God had to also grant another grace which was the perseverance element that God had to grant that to the believer. There are three different moments in a Christian's life that God is doing something. And he believed that one could be washed away of inherited guilt as a baby, infant baptism. He believed that God could ordain someone to salvation. But if God did not grant them that individual perseverance, then that person would not be saved. Here's my election analysis. Election in scripture only means election to salvation if you are using the Augustinian lenses when you are going to the text. For any doctrines of grace pastor out there that is watching this and is having conviction or fear creep in from the result of maybe seeing something that you've never seen before. Maybe you didn't even know this, some of, the, some of the things that I've talked about today. My admonition to you is this, is do the right thing in God's eyes. And you know what that is, do the right thing in God's eyes. Do not suppress further examination of this topic if you feel the Holy Spirit calling you to examine the text, to go back to the text, to affirm it. This is what your calling is, is to uphold the scriptures, to rightly divide the word of truth. And if the Holy Spirit is, is knocking right now, telling you, you need to go and examine it, do it. That's my ad admonition to you. Christian, believer, if, this, if that's happening to you, 
my admonition to you is to also go be a good Berean and search out the scriptures. I can't be the Holy Spirit for you. I'm only sharing that I am convinced that I believe the Holy Spirit led me to this, which is also something that I'm probably going to bring up in another video is, is the element that if God does ordain and predestine all things, he has decreed all things. And so literally everything that happens is decreed and ordained by God. Then God ordained me to be a Calvinist for 10 years. And then he ordained me to leave Calvinism. There are some Calvinists that actually believe that if you don't hold to the doctrines of grace, I've had them ask me the question, do you believe that people that don't hold to the doctrines of grace, do you believe that they're even Christian? I was, my jaw almost hit the floor at this Sunday school when I heard someone say that. This is how much this Gnosticism and Manichaeanism has crept in to the church through someone who is revered as, if you look at some of the, I've seen a lot of videos and historians talk about Augustine from you know, Christian ones. They uphold him like he's this like high, high person. And it's because they hold to what he taught. They're, they are a follower of Augustine. And I think John Calvin being another one of them, there's many things that they did that were good and good for the church and good for the people. But that didn't that doesn't mean that they had good theology in this specific area it doesn't mean that it doesn't equal that well i don't want to give away some of the stuff i'm going to have in some of the other videos this video in and of itself may not have convinced you at all and again that's perfectly fine my point here is is to share what i have learned and then to really just hopefully if there is any pebble in your shoe that I have brought about from what I've shared so far is that you can go be a good Berean and go search the scriptures and truly ask the tough questions. Am I correct in my interpretation? Are these people that I respect great pastors? Are they correct in their interpretation? Did Augustine bring these teachings into the church? Can you take those lenses off and actually look at the context and see if it lines up. If there is fear creeping in, let me just say this, is that it was scary for me. When I started going through this and I started examining scripture upon scripture upon scripture, it was a compounding effect that took place. And eventually there was a curve that, that just basically tilted. <laughs> it's, it's like a seesaw that I was walking on and I wasn't sure until that seesaw tipped over and there was enough evidence that I found that I felt like the Holy Spirit led me to, to then be convinced this is not the truth. This is not the correct interpretation of God's word. And that, that for me, it meant almost, it meant almost everything I had to walk away from. And I've worked through every text that the doctrines of grace, tulip Calvinism would adhere to. I've worked through every single one of them. And I can tell you contextually, none of it lines up. It only lines up if you put the lenses on. That's the only way that it lines up. If you submit to the systematic of Calvinism, you will get Calvinism. If you can take those lenses off, you will see that that's not what the text is saying. That's my admonition to you is don't believe me, go to the word yourself and see if you see the same. Now, the next video that we're going to talk about is regeneration preceding faith. And we're going to cover many aspects to this element. And so you trust me, you don't want to miss this. This, the regeneration preceding faith argument, what, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is it does regeneration precede faith or does faith precede regeneration? This was the element that convinced me initially that got me going to the scriptures and got me in the word to figure out where is regeneration preceding faith found in the scriptures because that is what the Calvinist believes. The Calvinist believes that God has to grant regeneration first so that they can be given saving faith. And that's the first thing that I went to in my search. And so I'm, I'm excited to share that with you. Don't approach the scriptures with the intent to be right. Don't do that. Approach the scriptures with the intent to see the text right through God's authorial intent. Because if you go to the text to prove Calvinism, you're going to prove it. 
So for my friends out there are, are sending me things and that they want to share these things with me. And if you go to any text, if you go to any Bible pastor that already holds to Calvinism, you're going to get Calvinism. I've heard every argument under the sun. I have studied soteriology. This is not to be, you know, me on a high horse in any way, shape or form, but soteriology, I have spent more time on than any other matter. I've been watching debates for years upon years, just out of just general interest and just wanting to just know what the positions are. And yeah, I just, it's just been one of those things for me. Um, and I think it matters. It really does matter. Go instead to the text. Ask the hard questions. Really question the systematic of Calvinism. Question your presuppositions. Question these things. Don't expect quick convincing of either position. Chew on it and ask the Holy Spirit to help lead and guide you. I don't think we give the Holy Spirit enough credit. We have to go to commentaries. We have to listen to sermons by John MacArthur. We have we have to do those things because who are we? Like we don't get it. We can't do it. We're, what we're saying in the, in that way is the Holy Spirit can't teach me the Word. That's what we're saying when we're when we're saying that we have to run to commentaries and other people to learn what the text says. In some sense, it's a spiritual laziness, and time and distractions is not an excuse. It might take some people, might take you longer to, to work through a text than other people. Other people might have more time on their hands than you and it might be a busy season of life, but that's no excuse. No excuse to not be in the word and to really ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand it. That's my call to you, is that you would just go be faithful Bereans. We need a church here in America of people that are in their word, in the Bible, and growing in holiness and growing in faithfulness as a result of it, and then going out and preaching the gospel to a lost, a very lost and dying world. Because the time is near, I believe, and we need to stand strong in the faith and to persevere and to go proclaim the gospel. I hope this video has been a blessing to you. I hope that it has not been offensive in any way was not my intent. It's, it is something that I am passionate about, but I hope you know that my intent is not to offend. It's not to make you upset. It's just to encourage you to go back to the scriptures and to look through it, ask the Holy Spirit to help you with it. That's my prayer uh, for you. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. If you like this video or you want to hear more, please subscribe and there's a bell notification that if you click on it, YouTube will actually notify you when I post new content. And if you like the video and you comment on the video, which I hope you do, that helps the YouTube algorithm push this out to more people. Again, I, this might not be your cup of tea. I do also do biblical counseling stuff. I already have some things on um, communication and fear and anxiety and some other elements of how to do biblical counseling. So if you don't like this aspect of the channel, hopefully you like that aspect of the channel. And I look forward to getting back into that here in the near future. I pray you guys are well. Thank you so much for watching. God bless. Take care and go be faithful Bereans.